Welcome to the American Diversity Report podcast, where we interview special people, diverse change makers and inspirational innovators. And today I have with me Everett Harper, who is the CEO and co-founder of Trust. In his new book, Move to the Edge, Declare It Center, he shares effective practices solving problems in complex, uncertain, and unpredictable environments. Welcome, Everett. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here, and I really appreciate uh, people who are tuning in and listening. As they do you. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So um, a little bit of context. Um, I was born in New York. I'm the first in my family to go to college, although my mom has one of the distinctions of being one of the first IBM, um, first black women programmers at IBM, which means she's probably one of the first black women programmers period back in the 70s, uh, all with a high school degree. Uh, it's pretty inspiring. Yes. Um, I came to uh, Silicon Valley in 96 uh, and the business school and been doing startups for most of that time. And then about 10 years ago, I decided to, um, to start this company. Um, and there's a little bit of background and history of that and context for that. But um, it was a really important, uh, it's been a very interesting decade since then. And um, what we do, Trust, is we are a uh, software company. We develop custom software for large organizations, public agencies, F1, uh, 5,000 companies, and what we do with that is really solve complex problems for them using software and using a bunch of tools and methods uh, to make things better. Wonderful. And I'm sure your, your mom was a, a great uh, inspiration for you in what she accomplished back in the day. Well, interestingly enough, and probably some of your listeners can relate to this, she didn't talk about that. She was being mom, right? She was doing the thing. I know, learned about it about a decade ago when my father passed away and um, she told stories of how she got to where she was. And she was started out in the secretarial, in back in the day, a secretarial pool. She got pregnant with me and IBM said, we don't really do pregnant women. So you can either come back after four or five weeks or you need to leave. She said, I'm out. So she left the workforce for 10 years, came back, realized that, wait a minute, this, 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 this computer thing might have something. It's no longer just punch cards with you know, military and governments. It's American Harvester and car companies. And she said, I think I want to be part of this. I think I want to be a programmer. I love she it. She took the classes, failed the first one, and with support from her boss, which is pretty extraordinary because he had nothing personal gain from it, studied and studied and studied, took the test, passed, and then had a 30-year career. Wow. Well, yeah. I will share with you that uh, my mother mm. had no background in computers, but mm -hmm. insisted that I take matrix algebra, which was the basis. Yeah, so right. Yep, yep, yep. Back in 1965. Wow, that's fantastic. Right? I told her, no, I was going to be a poet. And she said, uh, this is not a suggestion, dear. This is the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> love that. I love that. <laughs> and eventually, in addition to my diversity work, I became the IT director of an office. In, oh, no kidding. In 1980. Right, 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 right. Um, and I said, why me? And I and they said, because no one else in the entire office has ever actually touched a computer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you just keep on going. And I'm loving what's what's happening out there mm -hmm. and what you're doing to assist because it is increasingly as you say, complex, uncertain world. Right. Um, I can't imagine what your day is like. What is it like? Yeah. Um, well, one of the first smart things I did was have great co-founders. Uh, 
is my one co-founder is Jen Leach, uh, a white woman who's very, very technical, grew up technical uh, uh, in, in terms of designing software and hardware. And Mark Verlot, who's a white man who is also a uh, technical lead. And we worked together at a place called Linden Lab, which was a, um, or it, which created a thing called Second Life. And Second Life was one of the first virtual worlds back about uh, 15 years ago. So um, one of the things I did was make sure to have great co-founders and then hire great people who have expertise in very specific ways. So um, a lot of the complexity they deal with on a daily basis, but part of what we did pretty early on was develop systems and decision-making and value systems that enable people to navigate through these complex and uncertain situations. Um, my my co-founder likes to say, when there's a trash fire, most people run away from it. We tend to run towards it because that is some of the expertise that we bring for clients who ha don't may have may not have the skills to do that themselves. And we help guide them through that and develop software to deal with those problems. Wow. Can you give me an example? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So um, we are working with uh, the Department of Labor to help them migrate their legacy, old legacy systems to more modern systems. Why? Because if we remember all of the employment, unemployment checks that seem not to get delivered to the right people in the right way, well, it's partially because there were some old systems. And then when the um, pandemic hit, it was facing new information it didn't know how to handle. So we're helping make that transition with various uh, agencies, both at the state and the federal level to help with that. Another one is healthcare.gov. Uh, we were very early on. It failed as you know, people probably on the, uh, on the podcast know. And there was a very limited time before Congress had the opportunity and responsibility to yank the ACA legislation. So there was a goal that it had to get a bunch of people through the system successfully in order for it to continue. Complete unknown situation, lots of uncertainty, and an incredibly high stakes. Obama had bet his second term on this. And so we used various methods to work through that problem, solve those problems, and then build the infrastructure to help create, um, uh, create systems that other people could use later on. And that in many ways was the part where we were like, hey, wait a minute, we're onto something and uh, started building on that success. Wonderful. And I, I know the, the, the mindset for that is, 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 a, is unique to be able to tackle uh, the unknown. I mean, not that I, I did it with, like you did. The only time I <laughs> went into that uh, um, category of unknown future was when they talked me through cleaning the hard drive by taking it apart and mm -hmm. cleaning it with the eraser of a number two pencil. Wow. <laughs> nice. That, that talks nice. a little bit about how old I am. Uh, but, you know, you do what you need to do. Right, right, right. So and I'm, you, yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead, please go ahead. I was just going to ask you, you know, um, as a, uh, a black CEO, okay, does that change your mindset and how you approach all of this? Yeah. So um, for me, um, I think I share this with a lot of folks who are, say, not in the center, um, who have been either on the margin or excluded or whatever, you learn as a survival skill, how to deal. It's a lot of pressure. It's not fair, but you still, one still has to move through. And there's a gift that's in there is that I don't assume the same things other people assume. I assume there's other ways to get things done. And eventually I learned that I have a different perspective um, and so that leads me to say, wait a minute, if I have a different perspective and I know how to get things done, 
I can put those two things together and maybe come up with something that's new or interesting, or maybe that works for more people. So I think that changes my perspective. And I think there's a certain amount of resilience that comes from uh, having to you know, go up against different barriers that other people don't. And so um, I think that changes my perspective. Um, and I think last, I don't take things for granted. So when I came to Silicon Valley in 96, um, there are very few black CEOs of technology companies. You probably couldn't have gotten them in a very small room. And even 10 years ago, when I started this company, I started a group of, uh, I helped start a group of folks who were like, I'm tired of being the only one in the, in the office every day. Let's just get together. So it started out of six guys over a beer. And in three years grew to 80 people moving, you know, meeting quarterly, all guys, um, no programming. It's just simply to say, hey, are we here? Who are you? Welcome. How can we commune? Uh, what that says is there was a hunger for that, um, for that kind of uh, community building. And Black women had their own networks as well. And then some people brought all of us together. And there are other ethnic groups that do the same thing. So I think all of those things shape a perspective of feeling like I can navigate through uncertainty. I can, I do have the emotional fortitude to do that. And part of what sharing the book and part of what was tested in the company is, can we do that sustainably over and over and over again? Sustainably is the key. Yes. Yeah. If anybody hasn't learned that sustainability is really important over the last two years, I got something for you because <laughs> so many people have burnt out. So many people have worked so hard um, only to realize that their, their energy is draining in a way that's unsustainable. And so a lot of what we talk about is how to do these things sustainably. And that's why we build so many systems. Mm, good for you. Can you give us a, a one or two tips about sustainability? Yeah, sure. Um, and I'll do it in the context of DEI because that's the sort of uh, a way to apply it in a, in, a, in a domain that people are familiar with. So um, a couple of examples. Um, we very early on in our company decided we wanted to set down values and we wanted to write them down and we didn't want them to be like, people are our best assets or whatever that usually is with soft focus uh, waves and sunsets. We wanted it to be very much about verbs, we want to be about action. Um, so for example, um, we had it, we had it, uh, you know, appreciating uh, or bring diverse people uh, into the company, appreciate diverse perspectives, a uh, variety of different things. So we said, okay, let's have this and let's write them down because it holds us accountable to what these values are. That's actually a really important system so that everybody who comes in knows what they're getting into. In fact, we have it on our website. So before you even interview, you know what the values are. The second is um, on diversity. Um, we have a goal of, in many ways of making diversity be absolutely tied to the business operation. So, Many folks, I'm sure, have experienced where diversity becomes a side project. Oh, let's explore this. Let's do this. Well, what happens when you have a budget cut? Or what happens when there's a revenue shortfall? What's the first thing to go? All the side projects. So one of the key tips is it has to be very much in the leader's, uh, my job. I'm accountable for those outcomes. I may not do all the work, but I'm accountable for the outcomes and I set the frame. The second is we measure it. We make sure it's in the core operations of our business. So for example, recruiting, we set a goal. We want to be reflective of the US population. Most technology companies from most of you, know, for many of you know, are way below that, way below that. We have, uh, however, 54% women across all of our technical positions from, uh, res from research to uh, product, to engineering, to infrastructure, to security. That is really unusual. How did we get there? Because we put the systems in place to, to make sure that, what does our cohorts look like? How do we make sure those cohorts are diverse to start with? How do we make sure that we keep track of those in a transparent way so everybody can see those stats? How do we review them to make sure that they can, um, we can say, oh, wait, we had a little blip. 
what do we do about it? All those things start to add up so that we get incrementally better and better and better results without it being a heroic effort for a quarter. Wow. For companies that are, are trying, but many of them aren't quite sure they've, they're on the right path, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them? Hmm. Well, I think the first thing I'd ask them is, do you know why diversity is important to you and your organization? There is potentially a moral issue or cultural reason, but I'm asking really about how does it connect to the operations of your organization, nonprofit, school, or business? That's the key piece that I think a lot of people kind of like, why do I want to do this anyway? <laughs> right? And um, by doing that, it starts to point in directions that are important about what to do next. So for us, we, we address complex problems. Complex problems have lots of dimensions and domains and uncertainties and unknowns. One way that I'm, the audio, I'm, not, I'm speaking to the, the choir here, that you get around that is having diverse teams. So gender, ethnic and racial, uh, identity, um, but also skill set. You put all those together and then you get you put them together in a way that they can solve problems and that they can come up with solutions. And really the key is being able to create those tools and those processes so you can get the best out of those diverse people. Right. Um, so that's how I that's how I'd kind of uh, advise. What's the connection to the operations? So why are you doing it? What's the connection to the operations? How does diversity fit in with that? And then how can you create systems to get the best out of those people? And I, in my book has a lot of those tools. Tell us the name of your book again. Yeah, it's called, I'll hold it up. It's called Muti Edge Declared Center, uh, published by Wiley. It came out in March, uh, 2022. And it's really, um, it's really about a framework of thinking to move through unknowns and then to systematize those uh, innovations or new understandings. So, for example, one of my favorite ones. Uh, so, move to edge are things like retrospectives and pre-mortems and design sprints. These ways create um, systems, create situations for diverse teams to bring things up. Hey, did we check that um, that thing with AI to make sure that it reflected dark people's skin? Right, That may be hard for someone to say if you're a junior designer or a junior engineer, but if you set up a system by which they feel psychologically safe to bring up controversial or contrary um, perspectives, you will get a better solution if you allow them to do that and then take them seriously. So what we've done is created and used different tools to make sure of that. So. Um, retrospectives, for example, is a very good tool to use. Pre-mortems are a great tool to use, all of which is to say, can you get a transparent system where people can contribute what they have to offer in advancing to the goal of solving a problem? What exactly is a pre-mortem? Ah, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, so a pre-mortem is a, is a, is a type of using, uh, using a process called a counterfactual. It's a counterfactual. Um, and ironically, um, Daniel Pink just came out with, it's coming out with a book called the Power of Regret. And one of the things he talks about in that book is counterfactuals. So we've been using this for six or seven years, but here's how it goes. Say you have a big project, an initiative, a book, a launch of a product, uh, a new product offering, a new course that you're developing. You get the people in the room who've been working on it, let's say a couple of weeks before you're about to finalize everything. And you get everybody together and you say, okay, imagine this project in nine months or 12 months, some, some enough period of time where it's got some traction and imagine it is a complete and utter failure. 
we feel awful, we are embarrassed, it is really, really bad. Now, what went wrong? Now, the leader, as a leader, I will often say, yeah, okay, the CEO wasn't paying attention at a crucial moment, or they couldn't get my attention. Just to sort of model, keeping it a little light, but also kind of saying, okay, there's, I'm just as responsible for this as everybody, so let's, let's keep talking about it. What people will bring up is, oh, we didn't have this level of communication. We didn't notify this person. We didn't include this perspective. We didn't follow up after the first launch. We didn't test to see whether people were getting the same value as we thought they were getting. We didn't have any mechanism for improving it once we launched it. All sorts of things start to come out. And then the magic happens. Once people are free to kind of put those out, they realize, wait a minute. So what are we doing now to mitigate that bad outcome? Do we have a plan to communicate afterwards? Do we have a plan to improve things afterwards? It's amazing how many things come up when imagining a future bad outcome and then working backwards that you can put into your present plan to avoid that outcome. Wonderful. That's an example of a pre-mortem. I love it. We just did it with a, with a, a big client. So that's an example of a tool that is, is a system that you can share with clients. Anybody at the company is capable of running it. We know what the, the steps are. And anybody out there in the audience can actually figure out how to do it with their own projects. It's a real simple but incredibly powerful tool. And it avoids those common mistakes that is really hard to think of in advance. And it kind of makes it fun and it gets the team working together as well. Wow. How many employees do you have? Yeah, we have 130 employees. Um, we are a remote first company, so we are across almost 30 states. Uh, we have clusters in California and in Chicago, New York, DC, Atlanta, uh, Portland. Um, but yeah, we set that up right from the beginning to be a remote company. We've been doing it for a decade. So you get to pull together your team remotely. Yeah, so we, we have built systems right from the beginning and we have our all hands meeting every Friday. Um, and then we have, you know, various mechanisms, Slack and other ways to communicate, but we're on Zoom a lot as everybody, many people are. Um, but the thing that we're doing a little bit different, and this is also something I put in the book for those of you who are trying to struggle through, should we be hybrid? Should we be in the office? Should we be remote? The focus is on connection, right? We can feel disconnected, but there's things that one can do to stay connected and not burnt out, um, whether it's regular meetings or going the other way around. Um, we make sure that if people want to be off camera, that's okay. Sometimes you're just tired of looking at a screen, um, but we have transparent systems to make sure we get our work done. The focus is getting the work done, not whether you see my face, so. Right. It sounds, um... Well, let's put it this way. You want to hire me? Because I yeah. like what we're doing. <laughs> Where do you see your, your, yourself and the business, say, in about five years? What Ooh, good question. Um, so part of the reason why we exist, uh, our purpose is moved to Edge Center. That's the title of the book. But it's also to create... Um, great software, software is a superpower, right? And with every superpower and every superpower story, superhero story, you can use your superpower for good or evil. We're trying to use it for good. We're trying to have positive impact. So with healthcare.gov, we're able to enable millions of people to get healthcare that couldn't have otherwise. Um, in one of our other projects, we're enabling military service members who are uh, moving, and 15% of all US moves are military in any given year. And if you can, it was rated the second most, second most um, stressful thing after combat. You could imagine a young family with a baby and then the spouse leaves for another country and the person left behind has to figure out 
how to move and how to take care of your kid and all that. We are developing a system using software to make that move easier so that people who are serving our country, that one thing is less, uh, less stressful. Um, various other projects like that. So one of the ones that we really are interested in as well is in energy and in climate. I mean, how can we help people move through the unknown of what is the thing that's gonna be most impactful and quickly to reduce the carbon in our atmosphere? Um, and we have some projects that we're thinking about uh, and partnering with to, to work with. So I think to answer your question, it's um, we're a bigger company, Maybe we're about three, 400 people, uh, maybe larger. Um, we're still developing great ways to simplify and systematize helping people navigate through things. Um, and we are really clear about the impact we're having, uh, both for ourselves, creating a great workplace where people can thrive, and on the people that we're working with. That's the other really big uh, goal. Sounds great. I hope you'll come back and uh, report to us your progress and how things are going. Um, there's so much need for what I call futurists like you. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I hope that, um, you know, while I'm telling all these great things about what we've done, we we make tons of mistakes, tons of errors, do experiments deliberately, and some of them are, are don't work. But the message I think for anybody who's listening about navigating through unknowns and so forth is, yeah, go ahead and make those mistakes. We don't know the answer, um, but we can use processes and methods to mitigate those mistakes and then not make the same ones again, and then bring other people to, to help make things better. And that's really, uh, in many ways, that's the story of the company. I love it. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Um, well, uh, yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, for the interview and thank the audience for listening. Second, I'd say um, pick up the book. Um, it is available. It's also available in audiobook and um, audiobook form. Um, and you can get it at your independent bookstore, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, whatever the way you'd like. I'll share um, in the show notes, I'll share links that everybody can find um, and definitely engage. Um, I think the, the important thing is we, our most urgent problems right now are complex ones. And so the more that we can start to be okay with being, not knowing the answer, but still moving forward anyway, the more we'll all kind of be able to move forward and, and do great work. So thank you very much. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for tuning in. Uh, I, we will have the, the links up on the page where you'll find this podcast interview. Uh, and you can uh, both you know, explore mm -hmm. <laughs> and comment. I will look forward to that. Absolutely. So thank you again. And we'll see you thank soon. you.